Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He's the most recognized and influential Latino in New York City. He's a two-time mayoral candidate and the front-runner for the Democratic nomination for mayor in 2005. He delivered a personal ode to the immigrant's dream, the American dream, and the Democratic Party in well-received remarks before the Democratic Convention in a coveted time slot. He's Fernando Ferrer, here to talk about the Democratic Convention, the Republican Convention, and Hispanics. John Kerry, George Bush, and Hispanics. The Democratic Party and Hispanics. Welcome. Good to be with you, Doug. You spoke at the Democratic Convention. Here's part of what you said. Mr. Chairman, sister and brother Democrats, I am a proud Democrat today and every day. Soy el hijo de padres puertorriqueños. I am also the son of New York City. My family came to New York from Puerto Rico on the wings of hope and opportunity. We didn't learn about the American dream from reading it in a textbook. We learned it by living it, by working hard and playing by the rules. But today that dream is in danger. Families work hard, but the rules seem stacked against them. They don't understand why we build firehouses in Baghdad and shut them down in Brooklyn. We need a president who will bring hope to every American family. We need a president who will fight every day to expand opportunity for middle class families and those who want to work their way into the middle class just like mine did. We need President John Kerry because he believes. Because he believes we're a stronger nation when every family, when every child has the same opportunities that I had. My friends, electing John Kerry is just as important today as electing John Kennedy was in 1960. Now, back then I was 10. Back then I was 10. And every Sunday my family and I went to church and then along to my grandmother's ground floor apartment on Tinton Avenue in the South Bronx for breakfast. As the neighbors walked by the window, they would ask my father, who had me joining him, who he was voting for, and he'd tell them, Kennedy. I asked him, why are we voting for Kennedy? And he said, because we're Democrats. I asked him, why are we Democrats? And here's what he said because Democrats care about people like us. Now, I was only 10, but I knew what he meant. And that, that moment is when I became a Democrat. You see, Democrats care about people who work hard all week to spend some time with their families about people living their lives and working hard just to do a little better for their kids. So this election, when the talk around the dinner table turns to politics, I expect my young grandson, Brendan, to ask me why I'm voting for John Kerry. I'll tell him it's because I want for him the kind of America that made it possible for our own family to achieve the dream and promise of America. What I found striking about your remarks is the personal level that you dealt with it about your father, your family, and the meaning of the Democratic Party to this particular hardworking American family, but all American families. Talk about what motivated you to write the speech that you wrote. Well, Doug, uh, 
first of all, it's my vision of what the Democratic Party meant to me as a 10-year-old. It's not just about Hispanics, about anybody who gets to a city like this, got to work hard, uh, living their lives, raising their families, and trying to have their kids do better than they did. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the Democratic Party always meant to me. I think that's what it should still mean. Uh, when you blow away all the fog, move away all the clutter from the table, that's the heart of the reason why we are Democrats. Because Democrats really care about working people, care about the middle class, care about how you get into the middle class, care about how you support yourself and your family, how you do better, uh, and how your kids do a little better than you do. The American dream. So you're to this is the classic American experience, and you're saying it exists. But has the Democratic Party fulfilled its part of the bargain? Has the nation, in fact, fulfilled its part of the bargain to hardworking Americans, whether born here or born elsewhere? Well, one of the reasons I talked about it, Doug, was this is still a work in progress. It's still a dream that for too many people is deferred. Uh, it, for too many people has become an absolute nightmare because they've lost their jobs, can't find one, can't get a good education, can't break out of poverty, can't break into the middle class, can't break into a, a situation economically or socially where they can be independent, where they can support themselves and their families. So there are two Americas. There's the America of the hyper-rich and there's the America of the rest of us, those of us who have striven or are striving to be in the middle class. Is that the message? Much as we want the American dream to work for everybody and much as we work hard to do that for all Americans, we believe in this. It's almost an article of secular faith for us as Americans and certainly as Democrats. Uh, we've got to recognize that there are real inequities. Okay, you were on the floor during the convention. You got a sense of the the delegates there. Yeah. What what is motivating those delegates? What is what is driving them? I think two things. First, uh, the abysmal failure of the Bush policies over the last three and a half years, um, and what that's meant to the American economy, to the American people, to American institutions. And then a positive vision for where we can take this country. A vision of expectation in John Kerry and John Edwards. I'm excited about this ticket. I think uh, uh, Kerry's uh, ability um, and his uh, capacity for leadership, uh, Edwards' uh, vision for bringing people into the mainstream is important for our party. Okay. Let's talk about Kerry for a moment. Kerry, certainly prior to the convention and perhaps subsequently, has not yet fully engaged the American public. And you're saying that by when you sat in that convention hall, you were convinced of this guy's stuff. Were you convinced of it prior to the convention? Or was this sort of a, you know, a defining event? Well, you know, Doug, uh, he hasn't just been hanging around the peripheries of American politics and government for of more than 20 years. He's been really at the center of it. But to be fair, John Kerry had to do three things at that convention, which I believe he did do. One, he had to tell the American people who he was. He had to tell the American people what he believed in. And then he had to tell the American people where he wanted to take our nation. Mm -hmm. I think he delivered on all three. Those okay. were the three important jobs that he as a Democratic nominee had to accomplish. Okay. In terms of the speeches that you heard at the convention, what, what speech made the greatest impression on you, sort of in your gut or in your brain, either one? I, there were a couple of them. Barack, Barack Obama's speech was extraordinary. And it was, in many respects, um, uh, uh, very much like You're, what I was trying absolutely. to say uh, with my family. I mean, this is his version of the American dream. Um, and he spoke it so well. Uh, he's a wonderful communicator for Democrats, and I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll become the next uh, senator from Illinois. And I think perhaps the first black president of the United States. May well people be. People were already talking. Well, look, uh, people who looked at him that night said, this man this is, has got the equipment. Yeah, he's, got, he's certainly got the ability to deliver a truly affecting rhetorical speech. Oh, yeah. Okay, who, okay what else? Bill Clinton's remarks? Absolutely stellar. Are you going to give sterling reviews to every speech that you heard? No, not every one. Oh, okay. Bill Clinton articulated the failure of the Bush policy, 
the promise of democratic policy and the promise of Kerry and Edwards and the promise of America. Better than John Kerry did. No, they okay. did it differently. Okay, okay. They did it differently. Okay. I mean, to be sure, when Bill Clinton got up there, it was like Elvis getting on the stage. But Elvis with a, with a massive brain. Right. Uh, and, and, and Elvis's talent, too. That's I right. I mean, he's not a cheap imitator. This is the real deal. Sure. Okay. He sure had it all. Okay. Um, and I think um, uh, John Edwards, I saw him uh, the night before accepting his nomination. Yeah, see, I didn't, I would, go ahead, talk about it. And I thought Edwards's remarks, look, they're, they're not meant to outshine the nominee. Right. And to be sure, Edwards has the equipment. Mm -hmm. But Edwards, I think, gave a very solid oh, yeah. uh, uh, vision of where this Democratic Party should be socially and economically, one that I uh, subscribe to 100%. And, 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 and talks in, during the campaign, both in the primary campaign and now in a lot of the same language that you used. I mean, there, there, there's almost an uncanny similarity between the two New Yorks and the, the two Americas. Well, when, when, when he talks about social and economic unfairness, uh, the kind of unfairness that comes out of the Bush policy, it was the kind of unfairness that I try to point out that emanated from the Giuliani mm -hmm. policy uh, and from Bush policy as well. Uh, those are things that I think uh, move people who are really Democrats to try to do something about it. Um, and I think he did a good job uh, doing that and making a statement about the Democratic ticket. I think Reverend Sharpton's remarks had delegates bouncing off the walls. He can, he can really deliver the speech. Bouncing off the walls. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you've got to give him an enormous amount of credit for for energizing an important part of the base of the Democratic Party and saying, look, in his words, we're going to ride this donkey as far as we can. Okay, let's talk about, let's go back to your speech and speeches. Was your speech vetted by the, the Kerry campaign? I know Sharpton's speech was, but then he threw away the script and decided to do his own thing. But did they, how did they review your, your remarks? If they they did? all were. Uh, in fact, uh, the day after Reverend Sharpton's speech, uh, we were all kept uh, very, very close <laughs> to the time and word uh, limit that we all had. But the, the uh, uh, important thing is, too, they, they, uh, they wanted to make sure that we were all consistent with respect to message. Mm -hmm. um, Specifically? I, I don't think they wanted any bush bashing. Uh, they wanted to leave that to Kerry, I think. Okay, let's, let's go back to your speech. Let's go to another clip. I was particularly struck by this, these, these next remarks when you turn George Bush's use of Spanish against them. And I want to talk about their reaction to that line. <laughs> Let's go. Well, I have a message for our president in the language he professes to understand. Señor Presidente, su política es mala y no importa el idioma. Mr. President, your policies are bad in any language. So in any language, his policies are bad. What, did, did you have that line in the original speech? I had something like that in the original speech, and they asked me not to deliver it. I disobeyed them once I got to the uh, podium. Because it was, it, you know, in terms of the rhetoric of the speech, it was a very effective Look, line. I had to say it because uh, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people run for office who espouse policies that are unfriendly, let us say, charitably, mm -hmm. okay. uh, to... Uh, Latinos, African Americans, Asians, to Italians, to Jews, to the Irish, uh, try to dress it up in, oh, I went to Dublin, or I speak Spanish. No, no, no. If you have a policy, it's either a good policy or a bad policy in any language. Don't learn a little Spanish just to dress up a bad policy, and that's what I was pointing out. Okay. And in this sense, again, going back to Sharpton, parallel Sharpton's remarks that the black vote wasn't for sale, because clearly Hispanics have been more of a target of Republican initiatives than, than blacks certainly have, even though, as you know, the Hispanic Federation survey in New York shows that only 9% of uh, Hispanics are registered Republicans, so that hasn't worked. Talk right. about the floor. You were, you know, in the convention. What was, what, what goes on? What's typically happening during those couple of days? The interesting thing is, 
<clears throat> you know, when you have uh, Democrats, all of us nationally, from coast to coast, from north to south, in one convention center, you have a wide diversity of people. Democrats are not all the same. We are united by this one thing, and this is the, the largest degree of unity I have seen in conventions since I've been going in 1976. And, and I think this is motivated by <clears throat> George Bush. This isn't uh, the party or John Kerry. This is really directed at Bush, no? This is almost totally motivated by George Bush. Policies that are not only bad, but frightening. Scary people around him. Uh, people who, uh, who distort, who turn things around, who make, try to make the wide, uh, a wide swath of Americans believe that by cutting the taxes of the super wealthy, we're doing better for them. Well, isn't spin the great American tradition? Come on, what do you expect them to do? Well, but you know, um, uh, Lincoln was right. Uh, after all, you know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, uh, all of the time, all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. So we're relying on Lincoln and the accuracy of the assumptions. Okay, your speech, how did it happen? You weren't, I mean, this was relatively short noticed, wasn't it? Yeah, um, I was there already. I brought my laptop with me because you know, I've got to do some work while I'm there. Uh, and I keep in touch with my uh, with my email from a number of different places, but also uh, do my work for the Drum Major Institute. Um, they asked me to make a speech that Monday. Uh, so they I'm meaning I, the Kerry campaign. Kerry campaign. Who in the campaign? Oh, the New York folks. Okay. Uh, had asked me to uh, to be ready to do one and to give them a draft. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I had to spend the next uh, and you, and you couple immediately, of nights. You don't say no. Just put it well. Look, no, it's an okay. honor. Oh, of course. And I I did this once before in uh, in 1992, uh, the convention that nominated Bill Clinton mm -hmm. in and, New York. And, yeah, and it's a tremendous honor to do that. But it also gives you an opportunity uh, to share with Democrats and the rest of America what the Democratic Party means to you, why I am a Democrat, why I believe so fervently, why these choices in the public domain are important to me and people like me. Okay, go back to the speech. So they asked you to do the speech, but you were originally scheduled to do a Wednesday, yeah. which is the Vice President's Day, but then you get bumped to Thursday, which is the President's Day. How does this happen? I mean, this is not bad luck. Uh, they called me up and said, look, uh, you know, uh, I'm afraid we have to bump you to Thursday. Yeah, could you accommodate us? Oh, I guess you could twist my arm. Um, look, it's a wonderful day to do it. Uh, it's the day that Kerry uh, uh, accepts the nomination. Uh, in fact, when I was doing my teleprompter uh, practice, John Kerry was out there doing his. So, in fact, we were doing podium practice at the same time. We had a chance to greet each other backstage. Uh, and it's a great thrill still for me. I've been to a lot of conventions. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, an activist in Democratic party politics a long time. Mm -hmm. I meant what I said about this election being as important, in my view, as the election of 1960 was. That was an election that marked a turning point in America's vision of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of opportunity for Americans to feel not only good about themselves again, but optimistic again. Give people hope. It was that kind of election in 1960. I think it's precisely that kind of election 44 years later. I want to talk about Hispanics. I know, uh, you know, I'm stereotyping you, but I am. I'm typecast, but I okay. know, I, I understand this. Three weeks ago, we had Jorge Ramos here, and he talked about La Ola Latina, the Latino wave, right. and argued that the 2004 election was going to be a pivotal election, a turning point for Latinos, that Latinos had come of age. Do you see, first of all, locally and then nationally, this election and how Latinos are going to both participate in it and how they're going to participate in it? Well, let me take off my Democratic hat for a Go. moment and, and just speak as a, as a citizen who happens to be Puerto Rican, a Latino. There's a tremendous competition now for the Latino vote between two parties, Republicans, more Republicans are learning how to speak Spanish at Berlitz than anything you can imagine. The governor but, doesn't do a bad job. Actually, his Spanish is not too bad. Yeah. Um, Democrats are doing precisely the same mm -hmm. thing. That contest is, is going to mean something 
for the future, not only of social and economic fairness, but the future of the Democratic Party in this way. The traditional Latino story, whether you are a migrant, like Puerto Ricans are, or an immigrant mm -hmm. like Dominicans and Hondurans and, and Cubans are, you have the same issues. Come to this country, you're looking for a break. You come here for the reason that everybody comes here and that everybody has come here. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to do better. Uh, you're willing to work hard. You're willing to dream big. If those dreams are nurtured here, if it's not an impossible dream to enter the middle class, to get a job, to send your kids to school, to be able to support yourself and your families, to be able to dream bigger dreams for your kids than you even had for yourself, that's going to mark the turning point of the success of the Democratic Party as a governing party again. How does it, what is its relationship specifically with Hispanics? What does the Democratic Party tell Hispanics, say to them, not that they're tailoring their message, that's different from their, their, their message to everyone else? Or is it identical? Here is where I think the Democratic Party has fallen down. Talk to me. It's saying nothing to Latinos. Well. It's saying nothing. Uh, it's not saying much in terms of opportunity. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a plain kind of generic message. Instead of saying, look, let's, t let's take the opportunity we're given by history to take the bull by the horns and say, we've got a shot at being the governing party again. But here's what we want to do with that opportunity. We want to turn this again into a nation of opportunity. We want to turn this again into a nation where all you've got to do is show up Work hard and dream big. Yeah, but you got to give me specifics. I, I'm voting. I need more than your, you know, your chapter headings. I need the paragraphs inside. Well, the I Democratic Party not only needs some, you know, needs an articulation like I would do, but something that John Kerry and John Edwards, John Edwards has already started to do that, by the way. Talk to me. Uh, and that's one of the things that excited me about this ticket, his addition to it. Uh, he knows what opportunity is all about. He knows that a leader's job, among the most important jobs you have, is to give people hope, mm -hmm. is to build hope, so that when people come forward and say, I want to work, I want to dream big for my kids, you have that opportunity to do that with a good job, with health care, with education, with decent housing, with a decent and safe neighborhood. Okay, but, but, but again, we're talking about attitudes rather than policies. Is it too? Those are policies. Okay. But those are policies that create attitudes okay. about this nation, okay. about the states in which we live, about the towns and cities and counties in which we live. Let's talk about you for a minute. You seem to be enjoying private life immensely. I see you with your wife. I see you with your children. You look really happy. Now, you're the presumptive favorite in this uh, Democratic race in 2005. I don't know. I know you well enough. I see 95% that says you're going and 5%, big 5% in the front of your mind that's a little hesitant about this. Talk about you know, life on the outside and the attraction of life on the inside. I've been a public servant for a long time. I'm not in public service now, uh, although I, you know, I lead a public policy institute. We still have uh, an, an enormous amount to do with a lot of the larger issues of the day. I still maintain a level of activity in public affairs, but it is true. I'm enjoying my private life. You love it. I do. Uh, I like being there for my family. I like being able to finish a book from cover to cover and not worry about interrupting it, got to read a report, got to go over a budget. Yeah, I'm, I, I've discovered that I have a life, and now, I like it. Now, wait a minute. And you're going to give up this life for constant fundraising, all of these events, which you like, but after a while it becomes one blur. I've been through this stuff. Why give up? You know, I'll go the time it. you have left and, and, and be crazy, being a candidate and an elected official. I'll go through it in order. I detest fundraising. <laughs> I'd rather have a root canal. No, several, I'm sure. Yeah. The events, look, if it's an opportunity, I happen to like yeah, being no, with no, people. Yeah, no, no, okay, okay. But, I mean, I love dozens it. and dozens and dozens. Does it, I happen to like Okay, okay, um, okay. I'll give you. I happen to like that. 
What I do miss is the public service, is making the choices and trying to have those choices make a positive difference in people's lives. For me, the biggest charge of public service was building a park that was a haven for drug dealers at night and passing by on a late Saturday afternoon and hearing the beautiful noise of children playing under the watchful eyes of their mothers. For me, no bigger thrill. For me, no bigger thrill than walking by a bunch of apartment buildings and seeing window guards installed and knowing that was my law in 1986. Uh -huh. It saved a lot of kids' lives. For me, there's no bigger sense of satisfaction than having that kind of impact in public policy. So it's, it's, you're an addict. I would hardly call it an addict, but perhaps I am hardwired for public service. I love it. It's enormously satisfying to me. Uh, people have been uh, tremendous and generous to me over the course of my career in trusting me with their neighborhoods. Uh -huh. um, Let's, we got 30 seconds sure. left. Talking about your neighborhood, Yankee Stadium, the Yankees want to move it to Macomb's Dam right. Park and do what? You in favor? Well, in fact, let me continue. The New York Post, I was shocked I was away, and then I, you know, I, I noticed that they said something nice about you in the paper, <laughs> that the, the Yankees' plan was essentially an adoption of the plan that you had suggested for the Bronx. Talk about it in 20 seconds. They must have been having a nervous breakdown, one. Uh, two. <laughs> Get to the plan. Uh, two, uh, the financing part of it looks solid because the Yankees are going to pay for this uh -huh. themselves. Yeah, Look, but what about infrastructure? And if you're going to pay for a stadium yourself, <laughs> Build it however you want. Third, infrastructure. That is where the city comes in. And look, there are going to be a lot of issues here with siting, with where things go and how they go. And that's something that has to be part of the give and take of city dealing with the uh, team and the community around it above all. Recall that when we, we, uh, we did the Yankee Stadium in the early 70s, mm -hmm. it cast a long shadow over the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Now's an opportunity to bring the Bronx and the rest of the city into the full light of day with a team that wants to pay for its own stadium and pay its own way. Let's see if we can make this work together. We'll talk about this in a couple of months. You're coming back. Glad to. Thank you.